and gentlemen, my name is Noniko, and how's your trip so far? Wonderful. Thank you so much for cruising with us in the past two weeks. Um, tonight, I introduce you as your onboard multimedia flutist. And I'm not going to teach you anything new tonight. For the next hour that we spend together, all I ask is your heart. So I invite you for this next hour to open up your senses and allow your emotions to be set free. Is that okay? So what we are going to see are some footages from me, other digital creators, and source footage. And especially for this, our opening piece, you're going to see some beautiful photo footage from my good friend, Rune Konstro. Rune was here with us, actually, during the first three Icelandic voyages. And he has kindly allowed me to play my music on top of his beautiful works. So when I was editing this video, it actually got me quite emotional because it already brought back so many memories with, fr with colleagues who turned into friends and friends who turned into my onboard family. And I guess that really is the beauty and magic of traveling, is these precious human connection time that we get to share with those closest to us. Above all, ladies and gentlemen,
So after two weeks sailing around Greenland, how do you guys enjoy the scenery? Fantastic. Well, I was hoping more people would shout fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, places like Greenland, Norway, or Iceland, they have always been like a fantasy, something like out of this world to me,、um, because they are just so different from Asia. But also, it's not just because of geographical difference. But also because, and this could come as a surprise, I did not grow up being a very outdoor person per se. So if you ask any childhood friends of mine or my family, I was very, very, very far from words such as outdoor, being active, let alone expedition. So like a lot of people back in Taiwan are still quite amazed and put, can't put it together that I have done a 10-kilometer hike in Iceland. Because that's just so not the me that they grew up knowing of. But I really love this quote from the movie Me Before You. It goes like this: You only get one life, and it is actually our duty to live it as fully as possible. And this has been my life's motto since the university. You know, growing up being a classically trained musician, growing up on stage, doing competition under the limelight. All the way till now, exploring the wild world, even have tried offshore life. All these adventures have led me to here today, and I think now I can full-heartedly say that the scenery and the beauty of Norway, Iceland, and Greenland have officially made me fall in love with a life in nature. So one of my early imaginations was these. Northern region came from none other than the legendary video game Skyrim. I would not call myself an avid gamer, okay? Like I call myself more like an aesthetic gamer, which means I play games to enjoy the story and to get inspired by the artworks from the game designers. And you know, like I always have huge respect to creators behind legendary games such as the Elder Scrolls series. It's actually very delicate of all the game engines and design. So back in college, I took a class called video game music, just like the course title.、Um, the class is basically we play a game from beginning to end, and the final paper is writing an analysis, analyzing all the musical themes and cues. So my friends were all pretty jealous when they were all night up coding. I was sitting beside them all night playing video games and writing papers. So、um, the world that Skyrim was set upon resembles what we see around Greenland these past two weeks so much that when I first saw Greenland and standing on top of that viewpoint in Vega Sound, or seeing these beautiful ice fields just right in front of my eyes, you know that chill and the awe towards nature just came just spiraling down my spine. And it felt really amazing to finally made it real, to see it, to feel it, to smell it, and to just be there physically in person. It felt really amazing. So in the next piece, we're gonna dive into the world of Skyrim, mixed with real-world Greenland. And by the way, when I first started this journey of arranging crossover music into for flute solo. This piece, Skyrim, was my first work, so it definitely has a special place in my heart. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let's enjoy this epic music. And while we're enjoying, let us also not forget that the wild world is the most precious things we have, and it is our duty as human beings to defend for it.
So I do feel like I will be doing us all a very big disservice since we are on this theme of the northern polar regions if we don't talk about at least something about the northern lights. Do you agree? Even though it's summer. <laughs> so at the city center of Reykjavik, where you will go tomorrow, there is an aurora light center um, not too far from the hub, not where we're talking tomorrow, but the city center. And my favorite part about this center is they have this 180 degree screening room with very comfy mats for you to lay down. In total darkness, you can watch this beautiful Northern Lights film that they took all over Iceland with mats, you know, with music. It's, you know, for people like me who have not seen the Northern Lights in person, it was a pretty nice treat. So there are many, many different myths and stories around the Northern Lights in different regions. Um, like, for example, in Greenland, one of the most popular one is that the Northern Lights are spirits that, from the infants that died, either from accidents, being stillborn, or, or even killed. And for these baby spirits entertainment, they will play a game with a walrus ball as the ball. So when the lights are dancing around, it means these baby spirits are happy and are having fun. And when the lights are static or when there's no light, it means that these spirits are sad. Well, in Norway, there are also many different tales and stories, but I love this story that a Sami friend told me that he actually grew up with. So he said that whenever the northern lights shine, they believe it's their ancestors looking over them from heaven and reminding the living of their internal presence. It's pretty sweet, right? I like this one. And another of my favorite comes from Finland, where I had the privilege to do a study exchange back in university. So in Finnish, the word for northern light is called revuntulet. And if we translate that word by word, it literally means firefox. So the Finnish myth believes that when this beautiful Arctic firefox ran across the land during winter, its tail was swept snowflakes up into the sky that caught the moonlight and created the northern lights. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Pick your favorite. And I will give you a little hint, though. Keep the Norwegian Sami story in the back of your mind while we enjoy this next piece. And you might just find that magic spot that I found out just this week when I was practicing. Let's go.
so next stop, we're gonna go down south. I'm gonna take you all to a stroll to Cuba. Now I know we've been spending two weeks in seeing glaciers and seeing ice fields. Probably nobody wants to imagine the steamy hot Caribbean sun, right? But we're going to Cuba, the biggest island of the Caribbean Sea, and it is hard not to fall in love with a town like Havana, with the beautiful Malecon surrounding its old town. The Capitolio of Cuba, or the old American cars that are still running on the street, because apparently Cubans can fix just about everything. And it's not just these American cars, and you combine that with the all-organic food that you eat in Cuba, because it's still more expensive to grow crops with chemicals compared with growing them organically. So hence why everything you eat in Cuba is technically organic. So all of these little details gave Cuba this time machine feeling as soon as you step foot on it. And although I can talk about stories and experience in Cuba all day, we'll probably be here until tomorrow if I thought that. One of my most precious memories about Cuba was the time I spent learning Cuban music with a flute teacher that I found in a bar. A little backstory. Literally every restaurant and bar in Havana has a band, so、um, I got into the habit of visiting a different one almost every four days with my friends. So after a while, you know, I've listened to so many bands, and this one day I went into this new restaurant, and this lady was playing the flute with her band, and she sounded amazing. So I walked up to her and asked if she would mind giving me some lessons on Cuban music. So that turned into our very down-to-earth music lessons in the park. No fancy music studios and no metronome, no tuner, no fancy stuff like that. Just her and I in a park beside a very busy street in Havana. You know, like growing up, I studied classical music. So we start study the music style, theory, and history of Beethoven, Mozart, Vivaldi, French composers, and so on. And when I went to the States, of course, we learned about American music. So in comparison, Latin American dance music is really far from me in the sense that listening to CDs can only help so much.、Uh, my professor would always tell me, like, you know, you are playing all the right notes with the right rhythm, but the feeling isn't there. Like, welcome to music class. Everything we talk about is colors and feelings and unicorns. You know, those unquantifiable things. So. It means a lot to me that I spend those times. She really taught me the essence of Cuban salsa, which is really a, a cultural thing. It's in their syncopation. And what, when I say it's a cultural thing, I'm not even kidding. On the street, like any Cubans from young to old, could really be a great dancer. It really is in their blood, and you have to feel it. So this next piece that I'm going to share with you. It's actually a staple classical flute repertoire, written by British composer Mike Mower. Mike Mower picks three different types of Latin dance to form this flute sonata. It's called Sonata Latino, and、um, what we're going to listen is the first movement, Salsa Montenegro, and we're going to go on a stroll in the old town Havana, com company with salsa music. Let's go.
Thank you. Probably my microphone is reminding me that I cannot move so much <laughs> around with Cuban music. So um, if we're on the topic of making music video, which is one of my passions, is traveling around the world and making music videos, this next one is a much share. But not just because of the beautiful garden what I filmed this at or the culture that goes behind it, but because of what Henry Thoreau, the American poet and um, philosopher, once said, it is not until we are lost that we begin to find ourselves. Many people have asked me, and maybe some of you are forming this question in mind already, that if I have dedicated all my life to music, why don't I just play in an orchestra or be a music teacher? And the fact is, I have played in an orchestra before in Los Angeles at Principal Flutes. I have competed in international competitions and I have taught, of course, and I will always love performing. You know, I picked up the piano when I was four, started on the flute when I was 10, never looked back, and so music is my life. And to keep a craft like this till today still requires a very diligent daily practice like a pro athlete would. And I do love sharing stories with people through my music, and I love using it to inspire others to feel more and to find real beauty in our continuously being overly materialistic world. It is something that I truly enjoy and it will always be a part of me. But on the other hand, I also enjoy having a life away from the spotlight from time to time. The stage may seem glamorous, but it has, sometimes it can feel like it's always competing, always judging and having this pressure to always appear perfect. And I really enjoy learning and getting to know people from all walks of life. Every single one of you have enriched my life. And probably the most important thing is, it enables me to enjoy music and sharing and the arts from a much more authentic place. So after all these adventures, I now truly believe that outside of the competition stage or the Olympic field, life itself does not have to be a competition. And every single one of us have something special and unique to share with the world, especially to those closest to us. There's always a heart that must be free to fly, and that burns with the reason to know the reason why. Why must we all conceal what we think, how we feel? Must there be a secret me? Reflection, ladies and gentlemen, my arrangement brought to you all the way from the beautiful city of Hong Kong.
So I believe everyone has one of those questions that seem completely normal for about everybody except you. And every time we form our answers, even though it sounds convincing, ourselves are not convinced, right? I don't know about you, but for me, that question has always been, "Where is home for you?" or "Where are you from?" You know, questions that derives from something like this. And I remember that one time I was talking at Boston, and I went into this restaurant that six years before that day I had went with a bunch of college friends over Christmas break, and the waiters were just about the friendly asking me, "Where are you from?" And it's just one of those moments that got me that I thought. Huh? Interesting. Just six years ago,、uh, me and my friends, being freshmen at university, would have no problem just telling him, "Oh, you know, we're just from Michigan over here for Christmas break." But at that moment, I had already been traveling and working on cruise ships and left student identity behind. You know, left home and only visit Taiwan once a year for over ten years. I suddenly don't know what to answer. And you know, when you throw this kind of philosophical question onto the internet, sites like Reddit, you get amazing answers from normal people from around the world. One of the answers that I really like goes like this: Home is a safe haven and a comfort zone, a place to build memories, and a place where we can truly just be ourselves. So this next piece, based on this definition, I want to introduce you to my home. Welcome to the Great Lakes State of the Midwest America. So the Midwest and the Great Lakes State consists of around these five big lakes: Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. And the state of Michigan, this、um, green green state, is the only one that has direct access to four out of five of the Great Lakes. Within Michigan, there's a tiny little gorgeous college town called Ann Arbor. It is a place that I feel the most at home, with rich memories, a lot of growth lessons, and it was seven long, hard-working years with no moment that I wish to be anywhere else. And if you do visit Ann Arbor, you'll find that people in this town are really proud of us being crowned all these amazing titles because we do feel like the town and the people live south to them completely. So, even till today. If we remove the, if we remove elements such as where I was born, my passport, or where my family are still living, I will still tell you that Ann Arbor feels more like home to me, since it basically has shaped me into who I am, how I think, what I'm doing now, and maybe what I will be doing ten years later. It all goes back to here. And like I mentioned before, I wasn't grow. I didn't grow up being very outdoor person, so I share a lot of first time with the state of Michigan, and that includes kayaking, mountain hiking.、Um, not my first ski, but I have skied way more times in Michigan than anywhere else combined. First real camping at the Sleeping Bear Sand Dune, which is the largest freshwater sand dune in the world. Just FYI, that's pretty cool. So this next piece, ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite you to explore my first real wilderness together into the woods of Michigan. And just like Henry Thoreau said, let us live in each season as it passes, breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influence of the earth, wilderness.
So after study, living and traveling, working all around the world, away from Taiwan for more than 10 years, I finally went home during the pandemic. This is my hometown, Kaohsiung, the second biggest city in Taiwan and with the largest commercial port. Learning to fall in love again with the childhood memory of a place while appreciating it with a new set of eyes is in fact a real big challenge. And I would joke with my other third culture friends, like how come I never had a culture shock when I first went to the States as a 15 year old? Well, now I know probably because I was too young to know anything. But I get this reverse serious culture shock when I came back to Taiwan and during that first year didn't even know what's the common courtesy anymore and felt like a complete stranger and tourist for the entire year. But just like everything in life, um, after every difficulties and challenges, if we press through them, there are always stunning and beautiful things await for us at the other end. Just like this, the beautiful sunrise you can see on top of Mount Ali at the middle of Taiwan. So this final piece that I'm gonna bring to you guys is really something special. Um, the middle conductor and he, composer, Dr. Lee, is as passionate about the crossover genre as I am. So crossover means we both love taking melodies from contemporary songs and make them, arrange them into concert hall worthy pieces. It's one way that musicians like him and I are trying to keep classical music alive and to inspire our next generation to come back to the concert hall again. So Dr. Lee actually composed this next piece. It's a actual three movement violin concerto transposed for flute. For a concerto, you will usually play with an orchestra in a concert hall. Dr. Lee chose three songs from the famous Taiwanese singer Teresa Dunn as the backbone for all three movements. And Teresa Dunn, being the singer, she's also very well known across Southeast Asia and in Japan as well. Though she belongs to my parents' generation, her music is so iconic that practically everyone in Taiwan are aware and familiar with the melody. So he made them into this three movement concerto called the Golden Age Concerto. And I went through probably hundreds of hours of getting the score and type, a typing marathon, typing them into a backing track through virtual instruments. And that took hundreds of hours of work. Why did I do that? Not really because I like typing musical notes into the software. It was because exactly because I, can, I want to share this music and it enables me to be able to play it for people like you. Basically, whenever I'm traveling, even outside of the concert hall. So for this piece, what we're gonna see is some of the most stunning sceneries around Taiwan, accompanied by the second movement from the concerto, based on the song, the moon represents my heart. So ladies and gentlemen, come on your imagination. Imagine we are in one of your favorite concert hall in the world, maybe. And imagine that I am actually playing with an orchestra behind me because that is still my dream list waiting to be checked out of one day. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, let's visit Taiwan together.
like we don't all start our contract together so you know some of us will come on some of us you know come off on at different weeks at different days it just happened that tomorrow I will say goodbye to a lot of my dear onboard families that have spent a uh, quite a long time to get there with me so this encore piece is for them and I hope the music and the little video that goes with it just reminds us again that Friendship and love and human connection is really, truly human's biggest treasure and our biggest gift for being alive. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you again.
you everyone and thanks again for cruising with us in the past weeks and we hope you will come back with us soon and I wish you a very good night. Safe travels home. Thank you.